Right, good morning. We're going to take a look at uh, 133 M511 outline and start, we'll start out with number 11. In the last session we had looked at the operation of the compressor and the system and its operation. Now we're going to take a look more specifically at the individual pieces. So the first area that we're going to address is item number 11 where it talks about the operation of the basic air cooled um, condenser outdoor coil and uh, the first thing that we'll deal with is um, the difference between what we call a condensing unit and the condenser and, um, and specifically when we take a look at a condensing unit Typically, there we go, the condensing unit is essentially this piece here. That condensing unit is normally going to contain the condenser and the compressor. Okay, whereas the condenser is just a condenser only and we'll take a look at some of the specifics related to that now we're going to go into the powerpoint So now in the, in the PowerPoint, we'll take a look at that section here. So one of the things or the areas, and this is in your lecture notes, the, um, one of the things that typically has to happen in the condenser, and we've talked a little bit about this in that handout, is we always will take the hot refrigerant gas going into that system where it says hot refrigerant in, and that would typically be our vapor. We expect the refrigerant to condense, and that's really by the, the, the base word of that is condense, so that we expect that cooled refrigerant gas to come out. The ex we would expect that cooler air, outdoor air, to come in, and we would expect it to be warm to pull some of that heat and add some of the sensible heat directly to that cooler outside air and that's really kind of the basic uh, expectation of a system. It's always one of the ways that I can kind of tell if a, if a unit is not pulling out a lot of heat is the air, or I should say the difference between this air and this air, between the cooler outside air coming in and the warmer outside air going out. Um, when those two temperatures are very close together, you can kind of tell that we're not really pulling much heat out, so there's something not right. So um, the term... Um, the other part of that uh, item number 11A was talked about a condensing unit. This would be an example of a condensing unit. And the condensing unit, the condensing unit is going to contain a compressor and the condenser. So this is kind of one example. In refrigeration in, in our class, we'll be taking a look at what we call condensing units. And they're going to also have um, several of those parts and pieces in that. So you have the condenser, obviously, and you have the compressor in addition to that. Both of those two are in there. So very good. Um, this is kind of another example of uh, some of the different parts and, and pieces of condensers. And uh, for example, uh, this one happens to be a microchannel condenser. Um, some of our new refrigeration systems are going to this technology. Um, and primarily the, the biggest reason for that is the, they can utilize so much less refrigerant within the system, um, but that also comes to, there is some downsides to it. And one of the downsides is the charging of these units are uh, much, much more critical. And uh, so instead of having these round tubes, they end up having these uh, passageways um, that allow the refrigerant to flow through these little plates. So. Here's another example of a more, let's say, a more traditional uh, condenser. And um, if you notice on here, 
we have all of these little fins. Um, so they actually call it an enhanced copper tube and uh, is what I would see on there. So that's enhanced. And you'll see that um, as opposed to just a pure flat copper tube, this has so much more surface area and uh, just better heat transfer is primarily the main, the main way that goes. Oops. Okay, so that's a little bit on the condenser. Now let's go back to the outline. So one of the things that we had talked a little bit about was the term condensing temp. And we always consider the condensing temp um, is, is generally always referred to as essentially the high side. So when we're talking about, um, a, you know, what is your condensing temp, we're referring to the high side of the system. Now, how do we determine that condensing temp? The way we determine the condensing temp is simply by the pressure. What did you get for a pressure on your high side? And whatever that pressure is, we're going to find out what they call the saturation temp. Uh, one of our worksheets dealt with that, where you, we gave you a pressure, and you had to identify what the temperature was, or would it condense at, and that's what that uh, would end up being. So that's a little bit on item number 11. Number item C, 11C, talks a little bit about the term delta T or split temp. And um, really, the, the delta T, when we talk about the delta T or the split temp, what we're referring to, exactly what it is, it is the difference in the temp, and that would be, of course, between the condenser air and the, let's call it condenser air, the, maybe I'll even put a note on here, the ambient condenser air around this condensing unit and let's say the condensing temp so um, as an example if we had um, let's say a condensing temp of 105 degrees as my condensing temp and we were dealing with an ambient of let's say 85 degrees as the ambient that would, of course, give us a 20 degree delta T or condenser split. And uh, so that's really what this split or delta T is. Um, item number two, um, just put a line through that. I'm not really overly worried about that at that point. Um, humidity of controlled space um, really is uh, not really applicable to condensers. Uh, so I'm just gonna wipe that out. So the size, so one of the things that we typically deal with is this. The size of the condenser oftentimes can be an indicator of efficiency. So typically we would associate a larger, um, let's say a larger uh, condenser would typically um, mean more efficiency. So if I have more area to extract heat, I'm going to be able to do a little bit better job, and, and that's typical um, as a general rule. So efficiency related to that, I would say, you know, what, is, what does it mean for efficiency? Well, I would say greater efficiency um, typically usually means a smaller condenser split is typical. And of course, lower efficiency would typically mean a larger split. So um, now you might say, well, why would that be? Um, the more pressure, the greater the split, um, will generally mean that you're going to be consuming, with all things being equal, the more you'd consume more energy. So um, smaller condenser split, I would say less energy. And obviously, um, it's fairly fairly self-explanatory and then a larger split would be more it would utilize more energy so those are kind of the basic ways that we can um, we can kind of look at some some of the differences here um, additionally moving on a little bit further um, we have 
um, three functions that were related to the refrigerant phase and states. Um, so the first thing that I'd like to um, deal with here, and let's see if we can get this to go. Oh, doesn't want it to go. Okay, so the first thing is... First thing related to the functions of the refrigerant phase and state of the change. So the, one of the functions that a, every single condenser has to do is, let me see if I can change that here. I'm gonna put that in red and I'm gonna make that a little bit smaller. Okay, so one of the functions is, and this is, this is gonna account for roughly around 10% of the function of, the, of that condenser. And this first one is gonna be the term D superheat. Now these are all terms that you have uh, been exposed to already. And to desuperate the refrigerant, okay, and what that typically means is it is a sensible process where we're dropping the temp. And we know that because it's visible. There's a visible change in temp. So, so, and I'll be going through some examples with you, but for example, you might leave the compressor discharge line at maybe uh, 175 degrees, and by the time you get, and, and you'll see if you get down to the saturation point or the condensing point, you may be down to, you know, from maybe down 110 degrees. So that is all desuperheating. So that's one of the jobs of the condenser. The next thing that it has to do is is the most important and that is actually to condense and obviously condense um, that is going to be a latent change and of course um, there will be no temp change now no temp change there are um, and that I guess we'll go we'll just say that's your primary roll of the condenser so that's essentially going to be the high the highest percent so let's say that represents roughly 80 percent of the job of the condenser the other 10 percent is going to be the term um, subcool and the term subcool is going to be when we subcool the refrigerant that is going to be a sensible heat process and we're going to drop the temp so that is going to be where we will say we're going to have a visible change in temp. Is how that's going to be. So, for example, um, maybe the condensing temp is 100 degrees, and we cool the liquid down to, um, let's say, we cool the liquid down to 90. So that would be essentially a 10 degree. Um, drop so and if our condensing temp are 90 and we cool it to 80 that would be also 10 degrees of subcooling so subcooling is um, is another one so as you can see the functions and the phases pretty important on there um, moving on to um, 11e and the tubes and the fins there are a lot of different ways that you'll see that and uh, so one of the um, as far as the the there's some of them that will use aluminum tubes there's some that will use copper tubes, and they'll and most of these will end up having copper um, copper tubes with aluminum fins as a general rule. But that's really the responsibility and the part of the condensing um, of that. So these are all kind of examples of that. So this one would be, of course, showing you a, one version of the condenser coil, and this one. Um, both of these other twos are actually condensing units, so I'm going to make a note of that. Condensing units. And as you can see, they, they look a little different by their application. So this one here is an example of a condensing unit, and this one here is an example of a condensing unit. What's different between these two is the train unit here. This one contains the, let's say that one contains... Um, the compressor, the condenser, service valves, all those kinds of things. This one on the right side does that. This one's generally more of a residential light commercial unit. This one over here is more of a commercial refrigeration unit. 
they're both do the same types of things on there. They're very, very similar. They're similar in what their intent is. Um, you'll notice this one has the compressor. And this over here would be the, condens the condenser. Okay, that's the condenser. You can tell that li literally by, you know, all the copper tubes. You can see the U-bends on the end and the fins you can't see, but uh, that's typically what ends up being on there. So um, this one here, typically the way this works is you'll have the air. Um, basically what will happen is the air will go into every one of these sides, so the air in, and that would be considered our ambient, and the air out typically would we'll just say air out. And that's normally what would end up happening in those. And um, most of these condensers or condensing units, not always, but typically they have it where their air in is there, and then the air out is over is obviously there. So that would be my air out. Um, so and you can see that by the fan, and that's that's fairly typical. Every single one of these. Related to item F, you know, it says the, the delta D is needed for heat transfer from the refrigerant to the outside air. That is essential. If you don't have the delta T, you will not be able to transfer heat from the refrigerant, whether it's sensible or latent, it wouldn't make any difference. You cannot transfer heat unless you have the, the refrigerant has got to be warmer. So that's really probably the biggest, the biggest thing. So in a, uh, for most of the condensers, I'm gonna say, so I would say most um, use, you know, anywhere from a 20 to a 30 degree Fahrenheit uh, Delta T uh, for related to the efficiency um, on that. That's probably the most common. For refrigeration, it's, it's closer to 30. So I would say this is more refrigeration. So in your commercial refrigeration, um, most of the time I would say we're going to deal with about a 30 degree split and on a residential system um, anywhere from a 20 to a 30 is is fairly typical of those so that's a little bit on on those things all right let's move on to the next part so the next part is item 12 it says describe the operation of the receiver and um, we had mentioned this earlier about it's not in all systems so um, it is essentially a storage device um, there is a standpipe in it that's needed for the liquid. So this is referred to as the standpipe. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a line directly over to that. This is considered as the standpipe. Now that standpipe is going to pull the liquid off the bottom. So if the if the refrigerant in this um, if the refrigerant in this little receiver is is higher, what you'll notice is that that pipe will always be pulling off, let's say, the bottom of this. And if it drops down, a little bit it's near the lower part so it's really just an extra storage container it doesn't really do a whole heck of a lot on that so I'm going to go to um, on related to that number 12 and I'll pull up the next uh, little PowerPoint of that's identified as number 12 and as you can see we'll find um, there's only about nine little slides in there so this one's showing the receiver which is the component that we're dealing with now right now we don't have a receiver on this picture but we're going to show one um, typically. In this example, you notice that we have a compressor, condenser, filter dryer, sight glass, DXV, evap coil, and filter dryer um, on the suction side. Now the receiver is always going to be to some extent at the outlet of the condenser and uh, that's just saying, you know, if I need a little bit of extra room to put that refrigerant while I am trying to provide some sort of cooling, um, I'm going to, that's a, just a little it's like a, a little gas can that you know you got to hold a little bit of extra refrigerant. Typically, you would expect to have a prime, you know, mostly liquid in those things. So, um, typical receivers, you know, after the condenser, storage tank for liquid. Um, it typically holds the full charge of the system um, up to about eight, you know, which is about um, the full charge should take up only about eighty percent of the receiver. So you don't ever want to have it where you would put one of those in the system only to find that um, it doesn't hold all the charge. So that would really defeat the purpose of having the, 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 uh, the, the receiver on there. So I think that's probably the big thing. So I would say 
Um, it says obviously in this statement here, which is a good one, the full charge will only take up about 80% of the receiver. You always have to have a little bit of vapor um, for that. So when they say the full charge, the capacity is the full charge plus 20%, what we mean by that is we need to hold the full charge plus we need to have an extra volume of 20% um, for expansion. Um, so that's how that is. So this is another example of a cutaway of a, of a receiver. And you can see that little standpipe that we had talked about. So this right here is called the standpipe. Okay, good. And liquid comes in, it just falls into there. And then of course it would collect in the cylinder. That would be, you know, whether it's oil or liquid refrigerant, whatever it might be. And then that would get forced up the dip tube and come out through the king valve. And this is actually the service valve that would allow us to go to that. So it's a pretty nice little system. The next part of the system we're gonna take a look at is the king valve. And again, I had said that was looked at on the receiver outlet. The purpose of this was to kind of act as a service port. Um, we definitely wanna use these on pump down systems. Um, the, the valve positions, um, we're gonna talk a little bit about this. This will be one of the more difficult areas to deal with uh, that uh, inexperienced people will have and the first thing we're going to address is uh, the position when we call cracked and what we mean by cracked is it's cracked off of back seat position and that's going to be where we check system pressures um, the gauge port would be of course open and you have to have a gauge on that you have to have a hose connected to it it's got to be able to see um, you've got to be able to look at that and that's going to allow that liquid line to be open front seating would be what we would only use on the pump down um, when we want to pump all the refrigerant. So what we mean by that is we are, let's just say we are moving all refrigerant into the receiver. And that's what we mean by pump down. So we basically close that valve. And uh, the liquid line would, of course, be closed. And then the back seat is your normal operation, typically, is the way that would work. And the gauge port, of course, is closed. So um, when we looked at the compressors, we actually looked at all three of those positions about cracked, kind of uh, off of back seated, and then also front seating. And, uh, of course, uh, there's times where we never want to do that. So let's take a look at um, an example. So this is a really good visual of these that you have. So... There's my king valve, there's the dip tube, okay? And right now, as you can see, we are definitely in a back seated position. So on this receiver king valve. And so liquid's coming into the condenser, we're dropping into there, the liquid's forced into the tube, and we're moving throughout here. But right now, we don't have any idea what the refrigerant pressure is. So if I hook up a hose to that a connection, okay? And if I do that, I can now crack that, uh, that king valve. So what I'm going to do is turn that in a little bit, and I'm moving it off of the back seated position, and that's going to allow me to measure the pressure. So this is, you'd never want to do this without having that uh, gauge connected to it. So if I would go into a front seated position, and let's take a look at this. So at this point now, I have completely blocked off that, that liquid line. And there's no way any of that refrigerant is going to leave that receiver. So at that point, now the compressor is actually pumping all of that refrigerant out of those lines, and it's filling up this little receiver. So you've got some refrigerant in the condenser, some refrigerant in the receiver is how that's set up. So the um, in a backseated position, now that's actually going to allow me to then pull my gauges off, and that's going to open up. It basically opens up this line, so as you can see, it, it, this is all open, and it's a normal operation, and of course, now I can pull my gauge off, um, and that's essentially what would happen. Now, um, we talked about, you know, um, purging the hoses before disconnecting, so right now, you have to realize that, you know, if you've got a system operating at, you know, at 250, 300 PSI, or whatever that might be, um, because there was liquid in, you know, because there was liquid um, in the holes in the dip tube, there's also going to be liquid that's going to be in there. And just as a conservation measure uh, on systems, we try not to just totally waste all this refrigerant. So there's going to be a few ounces that are going to be in that, and that can be a substantial amount on, on some of these systems. So.
Okay, let's see if we can get this to go. And that's it on this one. So, oh, there we go. Now that is, so that's essentially just kind of venting off that refrigerant. So we'll be going through that in, with our gauge sets so um, you all know how to do that. That's kind of a, a pretty big part on that. So let's go ahead and we're gonna get out of that. I'll discard those and move out of there. So that's a little bit on the receiver. All right, we're gonna move on to the next part. All right, so back to the, back to the module. So related to that, um, a couple of notes, additional notes that I'm gonna make on this one. First of all, um, just a couple of notes in here. Um, number one, the storage device is to store liquid refrigerant. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, that's generally what we want to do. Um, I've identified the dip tube or the standpipe. That's another term for it, standpipe. Um, I can just put a note on here, dip tube. Okay, that's another, um, that's another way to describe it. Um, the one note that I'm going to make on here is it's only used on what I'm going to say is syst on systems with uh, TXVs, so thermostatic expansion valves. And the whole goal of this device is to really, let's just say, to ensure that we have 100% liquid to the metering device or to the TXV. TXV is the metering device. So that's really one of kind of one of those jobs on there. So as you know, um, this would have came from the condenser outlet. And of course, this would go to the TXV. That's how that is. All right, let's take a look at the next piece. So the next part is of this system is going to be the filter dryer that we'll take a look at. Now the operation of the of the liquid line filter dryer or the and the sight glass, which of course is not going to be on all of these systems. Um, the the couple of things just to kind of note on here a little bit here. I'm going to change that one. I'll put that as blue. So um, the as I had mentioned, you know, every single one of these systems, you've got to have, you know, it can only have refrigerant. It can only have refrigerant oil. Um, there must not be any air, can't be any contaminants. We don't want moisture in there. So it really, they have to be very clean, tight, and dry. So the filter dryer is kind of that extra little added protection to kind of ensure that things are going to be going. So um, the desiccant drying agent, you know, silica gel. So you could all imagine, like every time you buy a pair of shoes, you get this little silica gel. And really what it is, is it's a moisture absorber. Well, this is very similar. So I would just say that on this one, it's kind of like having insurance. Is it absolutely needed? Probably not, but we we still have it. Um, they, they typically will contain the, you know, the desiccant is a Let's call it, it's a drying agent, as I had mentioned, and silica gel is typical. They have screens, typically, is what they will, they will end up having. So some of the screens that are in there uh, internally, so that if there's any, let's say, metal shavings or anything like that, it would not clog up. The, um, that would be you know, preferable. You don't want it to go through the system. It is indeed very directional. And there is a, an arrow that is on there. So in other words, I'm gonna put a note on here, look at the arrow. So this one, we have an arrow that's shown there. Um, so that's kind of the filter dryer a little bit. Now the sight glass in itself, there is a, that's kind of your little window to see the operation. So. Um, this particular sight glass um, is kind of one way. So we're gonna, oops, so we'll take a look at, so you have this filter dryer here, and you have the sight glass, and of course, um, I'll do that. So the sight glass, um, that's over here. So 
that is my sight glass. And the sight glass, like I said, it's going to have a glass. It's a, it'll have a little moisture indicator that will change color if it's wet. So we'd never want to see a system that's wet. But if we do, that's telling us we got some issues that we, ha we need to address on there. So typically, um, when I, and I'm most, you know, again, there's some that are purple and it's perfectly good. There's some that are green that are good. Typically, if they are yellow, as a general rule, then that's normally going to say that it's wet um, as a general rule. So, and if it's good, that means it's typically green. Now, that's just an example of one manufacturer's version of that. So, let's take a look at that and I'll give you another view. And um, so, we're going to move on to this. So, I'll hit that one up here. So, the liquid line filter dryers, so again, help us clean up the system. It stays in the system, replace it whenever it's dirty. So if I open up the system and expose it to environmental air, I really need to, um, I need to make sure that I change that. Um, I do everything in my power to not expose them to atmospheric air when I'm, even during installation. Um, I, that's one of the reasons why we use nitrogen and we do that. So if you're ever questioning it, change it. Um, there are different types of screens that are catching any of the, you know, any of the shavings or the debris that might be in there. And obviously the, the desiccants, there's some that do are designed for moisture removal, and there's some even that also can contribute to the, to the correction or the removal of acid. Um, and there shouldn't be acid, but there are systems that do that. So in this image, you can kind of see some of the things that are going in here. So you have a screen that's there. You've got the desiccant over here. Okay. And there's some other little mesh screens and uh, interesting um, how they do that and you have an in and out different types of desiccants there's all kinds of different desiccants they use um, the activated alumina um, that's for uh, acid removal type and uh, you know moisture removal is somewhat molecular sieve is another way that's uh, pretty good um, acid uh, or pretty good water removal and then silica gel it's just for water only it's uh, so that's kind of the the normal the basic uh, run-of-the-mill one so they, they also make um, some of the filter dryers that are even biflow, what they call a, a biflow filter, which is what we need on a heat pump system on there. So this is kind of the, the typical when we're talking about that, uh, about the cores and those types of things. And again, a person has to kind of, uh, um, you know, not all filter dryers are the same. Um, a person has to kind of look at uh, what the expectation of it would be um, as far as what are you trying to do with it. So that's typically the way it would work. Again, if you're dealing with clean, dry systems, it's just purely insurance. It can't hurt. Um, and every system really should have one on it. So sight glasses, let's take a look at that. So the sight glass is always placed after the filter dryer, prior to the metering device. That's where it should be. Now the location should be indeed in the liquid line. It's to show me that, you know, what is going on with the refrigerant. It's just a plain glass shows the flow, it has a moisture indicator. So let's take a look at this. So in this example here, we can see that the little center dot, this one here is shown that it is wet, it's yellow, and they will typically identify this. Um, the green indicator would mean that it's dry, and I talked about this a little bit earlier in the, in the presentation. And then of course, you know, there's, there's no set in and out typically on these, but um, you know, it's, it, it, it just depends on that. So when I see bubbles, you know, like usually uh, if I'm looking at refrigerant vapor and liquid, they almost look the same because it's very hard to tell the difference between those two. However, when I see bubbles, that is definitely not generally air. What it typically means is you are low on refrigerant or you are uh, maybe have a very high load, something like that. Um, and that would be, that could also cause bubbles in there. And then, or maybe even a restriction. So you could have a filter dryer that's even starting to get dirty. And that would be another indicator to, to show that. Um, so uh, anyways, good, good system uh, operation in there. All right. Now, we're going to take a look at this next uh, part. And we'll, we'll just have a few notes that I want to make on this one, um, specifically, uh, related to, specifically related to um, 
the metering device. And um, a couple of things that I'm going to point out on here. So our metering devices that we typically deal with are one of them in particular is going to be considered as what we call a cap tube metering device. So when you hear the term cap tube, it stands for capillary tube. And it's a long, skinny tube. It's very precision. I would say it's precise um, boring. It's got a very precise um, hole. It is very, I would say, critical in um, the design. So the critical, like critical charge, critical operation, critical in design, um, and the things that really make a big difference are, I'm going to say, is the size of the bore and the length. Those are very critical parts of that. So that's kind of one design of that. Um, we have some of our systems in the lab that are very much like that. The next part of, the next one we're going to take a look at is what we call um, an accurator. Now we have... Um, accurators, and another word for uh, accurator or um, another term that's used is called a piston. Now, uh, piston. Now, the accurator or the, the piston is just nothing more than a little device that has a hole in it that allows the refrigerant uh, to go through it and it creates a pressure drop. Um, the size is indicated by a number. So a number, this will dictate, this will tell me what the size is. So I might see it there. I might also see it stamped here. Now it's a little hard to see, but that also would be indicating the size. So usually I look for a number stamped on, stamped on them. Um, it, is a, it is definitely, um, it is directional. Um, but there are different ways that you'll see different pistons used on there. So I'm going to just put a note on here that it is directional in its operation. So directional in its operation. Um, it can restrict in both directions depending on the unit. Um, the whole job, or the whole, let's just say the whole ident, you know, both of these two and every metering device primarily is trying to create a pressure drop. That is such a key part of this. So I'm just going to highlight that right here. Creates the pressure drop. And that's one of the things that it's got to be able to do on there. All right. So the next metering device that we're going to take a look at, which our first trainers that we'll be dealing with are going to actually have what they call a TXV. So I'm going to make, I'm going to basically make a couple of notes on your, whoops. Let me go back to that. And this um, TXV or TEV, same thing, is essentially what we call a thermostatic expansion valve. Now, thermostatic expansion valve is a metering device that um, will also create a pressure drop, but it has the ability, it has a sensing bulb, and it's got a sensing bulb that, uh, let me see if I can highlight that a little bit here, it's got a little sensing bulb over here which will contain a certain amount of liquid and a certain amount of vapor. So in this bulb, I'm going to call it the sensing bulb. That bulb is going to have a little bit of liquid and a little bit of vapor. It's going to have both of those two. Um, they're typically what it is. And it basically has, it's supposed to have the same or similar characteristics to that of the refrigerant. Uh, what I'm going to say is the system refrigerant. Whoops. Okay, that's typical of what it would be. 
And that actually goes directly to what we call a power head. And that's, whoops, power head, not power head. Okay, so that's what that goes to. Now, a couple of other little things on here. Um, this is what I would also identify um, as on the power head is usually they identify the refrigerant that's on the head. So what they'll say is, so in other words, if it's refrigerant 22, there'll usually be a label that says it's designed for this refrigerant. Um, and that's typically how it would be. If it's 404, it's designed for that one. Um, it is indeed, unlike the other, the first two, this is a, what I'm going to say is a modulating device. It's pretty awesome. So it's a modulating um, metering device. So that means that if you need a little bit more refrigerant, it's going to give you a little bit more. If you need a little less, it's going to try to give you a little bit less. Um, so the whole purpose of this particular TXV and why this is so important and critical and it's in the operation of the system is the TXV's job, its modulation, it's designed to control what I'm going to say is constant superheat. That's the job of that. It's designed to control constant superheat. And again, very um, superheat is really an important part of these systems. So to cap this off and to finish this up is, you know, the purpose of the metering device is, you know, the purpose of the metering device is we want to control the flow of the refrigerant that goes to the evaporator. We want to create a pressure drop, the delta P, you know, along with that compressor. But its job is to create the pressure drop. And what we want to do is kind of work together between the condensing pressure um, that goes to the, you know, through the device all the way to the evaporator um, is how we want to be able to do that. And that's the inlet, and then the outlet would be the evap pressure on the outlet. One of the things we do recognize is that anytime that we create the pressure drop, we also will create a temp drop. And that's because of a process that we utilize and call uh, adiabatic um, uh, drops in, in uh, pressure and temps, and where there's a constant BTU change out. So we'll, and I'll talk more about that in the next class. In the, um, but that's really what has to happen. We gotta provide that drop in temps so that we can actually be able to absorb heat. It's gotta be lower than that ambient temp of the evaporator. So we're gonna take a look at those things. So from a condensing unit, the temperature is higher than the ambient uh, to, the, to uh, one that's lower than the space temp. That's really what it has to do. So is we create that pressure drop. So what's, what's really interesting on these things is, for example, I could have refrigerant coming in at, um, very easily I could have refrigerant coming in at 90 degrees as an example. Could come in at 90 degrees, go into the device, drop its temp, and I could be down to 10 degrees as an example. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's basically um, you're going to have drop in pressure and temp, and we'll delve more into that. So that's a little bit on items, all the way from our items. Oops. Items 11, 12, and 13, as well as item 14. And that will conclude this.